Uh, welcome to the ninth episode of FutureCast. Uh, today we have two very interesting guests, and uh, it has got nothing to do with technology or anything like that, but it is, it is about building the future. So with that in mind, Julia and Björk, welcome. Thank you Thank so you. much. You are listening to the FutureCast. Let me start by asking, uh, maybe you can give a little bit of introduction about who you are. Uh, I'm Julia. Uh, I am originally from Baltimore in the United States. And I have a background in environmental science and specifically soil science and soil restoration. Um, and I got my master's degree here in Iceland studying organic fertilizers as a means of restoring eroded soils, particularly in southern Iceland is where I was looking. OK, yeah. excellent. Mm. And uh, I'm Björk, I'm from Iceland, uh, and uh, I studied at a school called Chaos Pilot mm -hmm. in Denmark, which is a three-year diploma in kind of like social design um, and uh, facilitation and project management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. yeah. How did you both meet? The way you do in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> friends of friends of friends. Yeah. We eventually found each other. Um, I was here doing my master's and Björk was finishing. It was, it was before I went to Denmark. Before you went to Denmark. Yeah. And yeah, we were just in the same social circle and she would let me go on and on about soil. And anytime yes. someone lets me talk about soil, <laughs> I, I will take that opportunity. And so she listened to me talk a lot about soil. And then she went off on her grand adventure. Yeah, and got to know uh, Bokashi composting in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, next time, like Julia moved after her master's, she moved back to the States. She came for the summer. And I was like, do you know what Bokashi is? <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, and then uh, after I moved here, I started, uh, I was like, Iceland is a, the perfect kind of like, mm -hmm. Like it has the perfect soil to start something new like yeah. this, at least like culturally. To uh, and contacted Julia and uh, yeah, yeah. Björk mentioned that she was interested in expanding the use of bokashi in Iceland, mm -hmm. and she wanted to like pick my brain a little bit about soil and compost. And I was living in Tennessee at the time, and I was like, of course, I would love to talk about compost, and like <laughs> I would love to work for you. Haha, <laughs> just kidding, but also serious. Yeah. And then she was like, no, actually, that's the plan. Yeah. And so I was like, great, that's. Let's do it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so you guys have been talking about this word Bokashi. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure we're all curious uh, what uh, Bokashi is. I'm sure we can Google and find out, mm -hmm. but it'll be good to know. Uh, what, what is Bokashi? What is this word? So uh, it's, a, it's a Japanese word that means fermented organic material. Or, yeah. And uh, it is a way of composting that was wasn't like discovered until uh, 1975 or so, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, so yeah, it's a it's a composting method that uses fermentation for the decomposition process instead of uh, aerobic decomposition. Right. It's a it's an anaerobic yeah. decomposition yeah. of organic waste yeah. yes. into soil and things like that. Yeah. yeah, so it's more like making like sauerkraut. It's like pickling sure. instead yeah. of just it's the full decomposition. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And it's like it is the it's the like most forgiving recipe for making compost in the sense of like it is uh, super user friendly. It takes a short time. It doesn't smell a lot. It. Uh, it kind of like tells you how it's feeling really quickly, like with all things that you ferment. It's very like, mm -hmm. it's it's a collaboration between you and a bunch of microbes. Yeah. And why would you why would you use this versus say the traditional composting, which is just throw all your organic waste in one place and <laughs> suddenly it becomes best, no. soil? <laughs> um, I mean, I got to know it in Denmark, mm -hmm. and I went. Uh, it was two girls that were a year ahead of me at school, and uh, they did their final project around Bokashi in Denmark, and they. Like what got me hooked on it was the sentence like if all, if half of all municipalities in Denmark would have uh, like used Bokashi as their way to treat organic waste, Denmark would succeed the uh, Paris Agreement without doing anything else. So uh, I haven't like looked into those numbers any more than just hearing it, but I was just like, well, that's crazy. And and uh, studies have found that like essentially because it's anaerobic, it's mm -hmm. happening fermentation that. Uh, it doesn't release as many uh, carbon dioxide uh, mm -hmm. equivalents as yeah. mm -hmm. anaerob no, aerobic. So, so maybe maybe we can jump a little bit deeper into this. Mm -hmm. So, 
um, I mean, composting, everybody kind of understands. Mm -hmm. uh, some people probably do it. But uh, why is soil erosion and uh, composting we should take seriously? Well, what's, what's the big deal? Well, soil is very important. It is not just, I mean, for one, it is the source of over 90% of the food that humans eat is land-based. Yeah. Uh, so there's first the agricultural part of it, but it also functions as sort of a part of a greater ecosystem. It's a, it's a huge part of like the water cycle. We need soil to filter water. That's how it enters into water bodies. So if you have reservoirs that you're relying on or wells or things like that, it's coming back through the soil. Uh, soil also holds on to a lot of carbon. It's also really important in nutrient cycling. So all of the food that you're eating, the nutrients that it's getting is coming from the grander nutrient cycle. And whether that's from the microbes in the soil that are making these nutrients available or weathering of larger rocks that wash it into the soil and make that available to the plants, mm -hmm. it's part of this greater system. And so I think it's really easy to think of soil as this inert, unmoving thing, but it's actually a very vibrant place. Mm -hmm. Soil isn't a thing, it's a, it's a location where sure. there's a lot going on. Yeah. And so, you know, right now it's it's easy to talk about things in terms of carbon footprint. Like that's become a very accessible terminology for mm -hmm. understanding our role in the environment. And soil has a big part of it. It holds on to a lot of carbon. When you lose topsoil, which is like the top five to 10 to 20 centimeters of the soil. That's where all the organic matter is. That's where all of the microfauna are doing the soil churning. That's where they're retaining carbon. That's where they're holding onto water. And so when you start to lose that, you lose the vegetation. It can't stay put as well. So then more of it erodes because there's less that's stopping water and wind from blowing it away. And you start to lose all of these things that keep the ecosystem stable. Yeah. And so you're more likely to have landslides and things like that. Or you know, in Iceland, we have a lot of dust storms. And that's mm -hmm. really bad if you have like respiratory ailments. You know, mm -hmm. you have to stay inside because sure. there's just all this dust coming up. And so it's part of a much bigger process, but it mm -hmm. feels very much like it's been treated like a secondary like sure. maybe, background. Uh, maybe, you know, bring it in the context of uh, just the climate change, because, you know, obviously everybody realizes climate change is real. Mm -hmm. At least I hope most of us realize mm -hmm. it's real. Uh, for those of us who've been living in Iceland, it's real. I mean, I remember I moved here in 2000, I came here for the first time, and my experience of Iceland in 2000, my experience of Iceland in 2021, it's not the same. Yeah. Um, so we are seeing it happen, and it's a gradual, slow process, and then it slowly starts accelerating. Mm -hmm. So bring it into the context of soil erosion and, and, and uh, as you mentioned, the topsoil we're losing. Yeah. You know, What's the big consequence of this? Because globally, you know, everybody's talking about climate climate change. I think this is one of probably under invested space. Yeah. Uh, primarily because everybody thinks that climate change is only about cars and oil. Right, right. But it's a lot about land use and how yeah. we use the land. And so there are a couple different ways you can think of how soil and soil erosion plays into climate change. One is carbon sequestration and the ability of soil to hold on to carbon. Um, plants bring carbon back down into the soil and it can act as a significant carbon sink. Mm -hmm. But if there isn't this well-balanced ecosystem, it can't hold on to the carbon, and so more of it is going to go into the atmosphere. Um, another part of it is just the ability of the soil to allow vegetation to be as productive as we want it to. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have any vegetation, you don't have any of the oxygen CO2 exchange, you also have more bare land that is just getting heated. Yeah. So forests are really good at sweating, you know, they perspire like yeah. people do, and that is why you have rainforest because you get a lot of rain that cools it down you know it's part of this bigger cycle and so if you don't have if you have just a break in the cycle and everything sort of falls apart around it you're just going to get these like hot zones where it's just sun directly on soil it's going to dry it out even more things are less likely going to be able to grow but if you have a productive forest it's usually on top of very healthy fertile active soil and those plants are going to do a lot to help balance the co2 and oxygen that we're so uh, it's, it's just interesting that you should say that because uh, I was just uh, checking out news where uh, a Y Combinator company called Terra, Terra Formation, I think, mm. they actually just raised $30 million to basically do massive reforestation. And then this is actually not just planting trees, it's actually a whole system of trying to just build forests. Yeah. You mm. know, like which is kind of 
strange to talk about, right? I mean, we, we always think that forests just exist and, and now we as humans are building forests, which is quite weird. And, and, but, but that's what it's about, right? The future has to be weird. Mm. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you know, it'll look like the past. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, so let's uh, dive a little bit into uh, what you are doing. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell you what my motivation for inviting you into this podcast. One is, um, I've lived in Iceland long enough to know that Iceland is a paradise for me because you can literally build anything you want. Unfortunately, most of Icelanders don't think so. Mm-hmm. I think that's actually a wrong mm-hmm. mindset, right? Uh, we, we'd rather focus on things we know rather than focus on things that obviously the future needs. Mm-hmm. And, and if we build it, guess what? If nobody thinks about the future and don't build it, it's not going to happen on its own, right? right? Somebody has to do it. And um, the reason I got very interested was because of what you were saying, which is soil erosion in the south. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, it's, it's a very popular tourist destination. A lot of people drive up and down. Yeah. I've driven there many times. And I've always wondered these acres and acres of land. And there's no farming there. Right. Right? Like mm. when I say farm, you know, Iceland farm and maybe, you know, I'm from India. Farming in India are very different. <laughs> yeah. And growing things when I've asked. They're like, oh, we can't grow stuff here. And I'm like, really? Why not? Like, we can grow stuff in a greenhouse. Yeah. Why can't we grow actually in nature? <laughs> I'm pretty sure we should be able to do that, right? We understand the science. Mm-hmm. And that's why uh, I, I read a little, little bit about your work and what you've been studying. Yeah. And, and I think um, this is probably one of the big opportunities in front of Iceland, because South is actually quite fertile area. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you can reclaim some of this land, you can pretty much grow stuff. Yeah. And, and you can grow all kinds of stuff. Yeah. You yeah. know? And, 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 and that's why I'm, I'm very interested in what you guys are doing. And, and we'll talk about scale, you know, how do you make everybody do it? You know, all that, all, that, all yeah. that is is a hard problem. So tell me what you're building. So, so tell me about the company. Mm. Uh, I know there's a company, and, and, and tell me about the project that you guys have done yeah. to, to bring some science into it. So. Yeah, um, so this started as, um, like, yeah, our company started as uh, just hosting workshops for individuals to teach them how to do Bokashi composting at home. Mm-hmm. And, it, uh, and the reason why we did it as workshops was very much a, like, we wanted people to, because a lot of the climate like action that people are taking or doing, it's it, it's very catered to like buy something here or don't mm. buy this right. or like or it's conversations on the internet, but it's very like or like it's meetings where we talk about things, but it's uh, it was kind of exciting to have a tool where you got to do something with your hands. Sure. And we were also kind of like we wanted to sell the buckets, but also teach people how to do it. Because you can like buy a thing that is like, oh, it's environmentally friendly, but I'll learn how to do it later. And then accidentally have like a plastic bucket in your cabinet for a year. So sure. we did that. We wanted to teach it. But we also wanted people to meet other people that they wouldn't necessarily have met otherwise and be like, OK, there's a lot of other people doing it. It's not just me making an effort that doesn't matter at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, then but let me stop you there. What's yeah. the name of the company? It's called. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, it's called the uh, Jarkjarnar Okay. Uh, which is just like the composting c- mm-hmm. community or collective, mm-hmm. or yeah. yeah. Sure. And, and how many workshops have you guys held so far? And how I many people you have touched through what you're building? I think we've had around like we've we haven't done any. Fo- we didn't do any workshops last year because uh, of mm. obvious reasons. Yeah. Uh, I think we've done around. 10, but it started us, I think we, it started with 170 households that we did workshops for. And then we created like just a group on Facebook for those people who they wanted to ask mm-hmm. around and into it. And that group has just like from word of mouth and people being interested in this grown to I think 2,000 plus people mm-hmm. now, yeah. something mm-hmm. like that. And that's like a very lively community. That's awesome. And yeah. I think it was also because of that and how helpful everybody was and so interested that we were also just like, actually in Iceland there is the responsibility of municipalities to do waste management. Mm-hmm. And here, like whenever an individual buys a composting bucket, they are like doing way more work than maybe is necessary of them. And mm. they're saving a lot of money for the municipality without them doing any like service for them. So. Sure. 
uh, that's where we decided to kind of step in and uh, see if whether we could like cater to municipalities mm -hmm. um, and thus like get more people through that and actually like you know that's where the responsibility is um, and then we uh, started a collaboration with uh, Sisla, which is the a municipality in the or like a county in the south mm -hmm. um, and Langreisland, and mm -hmm. uh, which so, like so happens that their headquarters are in Rangavatasisla as well. So it's very like it's very uh, very local and makes sense to be there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so tell me about the work, the project, the pilot project mm -hmm. that you did for the municipality. What what happened there? Mm -hmm. What did you find? Uh, by the way, I read the paper. It's, oh. it's great. Oh, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> it's so, great. Tell me, tell me more. Uh, yeah, so uh, we did uh, the first phase of our pilot last year, which was essentially like because uh, Bokashi composting has been around for a few decades now, and people have been doing it at home or they've been using it in agriculture, but as a centralized processing in waste management, it hadn't been done yet. So mm -hmm. we kind of went in and in a way where it's like, how much can we learn for as little money as possible? And like proof of concept. Yeah. Like, like can this be scaled up this way? Can yeah. we collect from multiple homes and mm. centrally process it rather yeah. than individuals doing it? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And uh, it, it worked. We were able to ferment around three tons of waste. Uh, but we also like came up with hic like hiccups, uh, mostly because we were getting waste that was being sorted for a different kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. That was industrial composting, which is like also great, but we weren't doing that. So uh, now we just started the second phase of our pilot. Yeah, we're like perfecting it. Yeah. Okay. Starting to perfect it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. there we are focusing on uh, essentially like making mm -hmm. it all much more efficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, both with like an upstream approach, so we're like meeting the households, they're getting different buckets to sort their waste into, um, and we're doing like a like ha kind of like a pre-fermentation uh, straight away at home, mm -hmm. and uh, we're just figure like we've we're hopefully it's we're, like I mean we're testing it now, but a way for it where it's like how can uh, households do the minimum amount of work, but in a way that like gives us like saves us a lot of time and creates a lot more quality product. Okay. Uh, at the end. So, so maybe this is the time to demo the bucket. Yeah. So, so, so show us what is what okay. is this. Okay. So we we brought a couple mm. iterations of of how the Bokashi system works. So okay. first we have like the home Should the home bucket. This is like the regular Bokashi bucket if you yeah. buy yeah. it at the um, store. Excluding that. Yep. Uh, so this is what you can buy to have in your house, yeah. and it comes with all these different parts. So maybe show it in the camera yeah. what's inside it. So right now there are some mittens in there. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not, let's not Don't look compost the mittens. Um, so this is what the bucket looks like. Yeah. I just cleaned mine out, so it's a, a little schmutzy still. Yeah. But essentially what is important in these bucket designs is that there's a drain tap. Yeah. Um, there's like a little filter for the bottom so mm -hmm. that water can drain out, and that goes at the bottom. And then you want to have an airtight seal at the top. And those are like the important elements, because you can make a bucket like this yourself, which yeah. is like nesting buckets. Mm -hmm. um, and what you do with this is you first take, this is inoculated bran, mm -hmm. and it's inoculated with a blend of like five different types of microorganisms. So mm -hmm. it's uh, lactobacilli, actinomyces, yeast. And uh, photosynthetic. Photosynthetic bacteria. Yeah. Wasn't it just four? Four. Yeah, four. Okay. <laughs> um, and so this works as both a source of carbon because mm -hmm. uh, food is really rich in nitrogen. And mm -hmm. if you have too much nitrogen in your compost, it can throw off the balance. It might not compost exactly the way you want it. Microbes like carbon, plants mm -hmm. like carbon, they all work together. Yeah. So this is like a source of carbon that's inoculated with these effective microorganisms. And they're the ones doing the fermentation. Okay. And so when you have a new bucket like that, you'll first put some bran on the bottom. You'll add your layer of food waste. You'll sprinkle a little more on so, top. So tell me more about food waste. What can go in this and what cannot go in? Yeah. So essentially you can put like you, you can put almost any kind of like kitchen scraps. You can get like organic. Organic. Yeah. 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 So you can put uh, you can meat and uh, dairy and fish and like fish bones and chicken bones, yeah. citrus, coffee, like all of the things that you often hear that you're not supposed to put in there. 
uh, and then like you know vegetables and fruits and mm -hmm. baked sure. goods. And yeah. So organic material, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah. And like generally, you don't want it to be too liquidy. So that's that's mm. sort of like the limit that we yeah. put on is like mm -hmm. don't just put straight milk into yeah. it. But if it's like a milky product, yeah. mm -hmm. it can go in. Mm -hmm. And you don't want yeah. It's the same with like oil. Like you you want definitely mm -hmm. food that is cooked with oil. It's all good. But sure. uh, you're not gonna like pour the rest of your yeah sun dried tomato oil into it. Yeah. And like that. Yeah, and um, so as you as you add a layer and put more bran on top, you then can take, we have like a plastic bag we use or like a plastic plunger to push it down. You want to get as little air inside as possible. So the more you push it, the less air it's going to be exposed to. And you can just slowly fill up this bucket. And once it's full, you let it ferment for two full weeks. And then you can bury it in your garden or you can make your own little soil factory where you take like old soil from maybe an old potted plant and you can sort of revitalize it by adding this fermented material to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. So I probably don't have to buy soil from Biko if yeah. I if no, I do No, I mean this. if you can go do it in your if you have a garden, you yeah. can you can do yeah. that. And oh, yeah. uh, and then like I mean we live in Iceland, so soil freezes during winter. So you can either like prep for winter by like just digging a little bit up, so like during and keeping it in your, keeping it inside so mm -hmm. it doesn't freeze. If you have stuff to mix during the winter time, um, or yeah. like or during winter time, you could buy. Yeah. 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 Very, very cool. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a gloss, I'm a mm. closet gardener. <laughs> yeah. I, I help yeah. my uh, wife and my mother-in-law. We have a summer house, and we planted like I think, I don't know how many trees we planted. We've been planting every year. Mm. So we have a compost there, and it's the old traditional way. We just get all the waste, we put it in one place, and then, you know, hopefully it becomes soil. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so this was new. So because I was going to do an interview, I went and did some uh, homework. I went yeah. and saw some YouTube videos. And if you guys have any videos, you know, you just share it with me. We'll yeah. put it into the into the comment section that you made with your community. Absolutely. But of course, anybody who is interested can go find out how to make this. Yeah. Um, so so tell me about your future plans. What's uh, what's in store? What are you what are you thinking of doing in the future? Well, so I guess in terms of the pilot project, which is sort of the like map that we're setting up for ourselves of how we want to go forward, um, right now we're perfecting the, the processing portion. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. first was proof of concept. Now we want to perfect processing and pick up and figure out the service. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Like, yeah. And then yeah. the other end of that, which will probably be phase three, is figuring out how to make a consistent end product. because. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about soil erosion, we've talked about food waste, but ultimately it's part of this larger circle that we are then going to be able to make fertilizer, which is then used to grow more food, which can then be used to make more fertilizer. Mm, and sure. so in order for this to like feel like we've completed the circle, we want to have a consistent fertilizer that we can give either in terms yeah. of land reclamation or agricultural use. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's that's the next step of the pilot project is how do we make a consistent end product that people can buy it and know what they're getting, know that it has the right nutrients right. available to them. So, so how are you guys funding this now? What is the, what is the funding mechanism? Currently we are, uh, we have a, we got a big grant from uh, the climate fund okay. Okay. this spring. Mm -hmm. um, That's great. And uh, we got a few grants last year and I mean we're still in the like we're developing and perfecting the have you product. have you reached out to uh, some of the garden stores because by the way they sell soil yeah yeah right? yeah, you know? yeah yeah like it's, it's kind of seems like obvious <laughs> yeah. to me if yeah. you're going to make it's really commodity. rich soil yeah yeah and we don't have to by the way i don't know where that soil is made so mm. I, I have not looked into it but yeah. once you start looking into it you kind of scratch your head yeah. and say it's Why are we shipping this from yeah. the UK? And it's also, it's part of this greater, like, with chemical fertilizers. Like, yeah. the, the broken loop that we have right now is that we have food, we throw it in a landfill, it produces methane. That's a problem. Yeah. And then we make chemical fertilizers, which the nitrate process is also very polluting. And also phosphorus is a, is a mined nutrient, and that's a non-renewable mined nutrient. And then we're throwing the actual nutrients away. And so that's already, like, a weird thing that we're getting fertilizer from like a totally new point every time. But now there's also more research coming out about potting soils and potting mixes that have peat in them because peat is being harvested. And in order to do that, you drain wetlands and that leads to more methane release and then you're taking the peat and so that's more carbon that's being released and then it's being shipped and then it's used for like who knows how long. Right. And so... Uh, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting conversation and for me the, um, the big challenge is that the economic models Right? Mm -hmm. For example, I go to Kartheimar or whatever, mm -hmm. and I buy a bag of soil. Mm -hmm. 
there's a price on it. Mm -hmm. And usually this is kind of the, the break point for a lot of things because you're a startup, you're just building this idea, you're perfecting this, you're trying to make this work. Uh, but if you build a business model that competes with that, right? Mm. And by the way, you will probably not make money up front, mm -hmm. but the minute you put the carbon cost on it, Mm -hmm. you're probably going to be a lot cheaper than anything that gets shipped into Iceland. Yeah. Um, you know, for anybody who would listen, I always tell them it's a terrible idea to be a vegan in Iceland. <laughs> yeah. Because, and, and by the way, vegan for health reasons, fine. But if you're a vegan because you want to turn climate change, it's a terrible idea, right? Yeah. The, the carbon footprint in any of the vegan products in Iceland is so high mm, yeah. that you are causing climate change by yeah. becoming vegan. Mm. So don't become a vegan in Iceland, <laughs> right? It's all about localized solutions. So like what works in one place won't necessarily work in another. Same goes for soil, same goes for diet, same goes for energy usage. You know, mm -hmm. like mm. Iceland has all this abundance of energy. The same solution is not gonna apply to East Coast America. No. Like we don't have geothermal. No. And so it is like you have to think of what you're doing in a localized context right. and what's best for the place that you're in. I, um, I mean, I, I run a venture small seed fund. Mm. The whole thesis behind it is decentralization. And by the way, in the technology world, decentralization, everybody thinks about crypto and Bitcoin yeah. and blah, blah, blah. But decentralization taken in the broadest of context is the most sustainable model, mm. right? For example, central solutions usually break down because it is, it can't factor in all the parameters. But if you decentralize it, for example, if each household does this composting, and they grow a part of their stuff, mm. which they don't probably source from the stores, guess what? It actually is a much more economically and ecologically better solution. So decentralized, localized and food that, sourcing. That's like, that is the advantage that we see in Bokashi because, uh, and that's why like we're especially been like focusing on uh, municipalities in like rural Iceland mm -hmm. because uh, building an industrial uh, composting plant, the like aerobic yeah. ones, sure. it's, it's really like it's expensive, it's really big and it yeah. doesn't make sense for smaller communities. So sure. currently like smaller municipalities that live far away, like they're uh, that, or like that are far away from uh, bigger ones, they're driving organic waste hundreds of kilometers and it's heavy waste. Yeah. And it's a really valuable resource that they're like driving out of their right. bounds. And I think, you know, this is becoming a team, right? Yeah. You're and talking then, about waste as a valuable yeah, resource. Yeah. Right. You know, and then yeah. what Bokashi has is that it doesn't need a lot of energy, it doesn't need a lot of space, you get kind of the same amount of stuff that you put into it. It doesn't, you know, like mm -hmm. evaporate into uh, How long does it take for it to uh, so start becoming useful? On like on this, like on a large scale that we're doing it, we're fermenting it for eight weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but in the household, you can do it for two weeks. Two weeks, yeah, yeah. okay. So, uh, um, so, and that's, yeah, that's so exciting to get to like, you're not driving a resource out of town to get it composted and driving the compost back into town. And like yeah. that's also one of the big hurdles for farmers to use organic uh, fertilizer is that it's really heavy to move it. Like, you know, yeah. it's heavy yeah. to yeah. Uh, I mean, transport. there are uh, so many things in the world that just don't make any sense when you start looking at them mm. with a closer eye. Yeah. And yeah. this is one of those things that, you know, it just doesn't make any sense why we don't do it. Yeah, it's, right? it's, it's so it, common sense and it's, yeah. There's such an opportunity in it. Like that's, I think, I mean, that's what I got from like learning everything about soil from Julia is that we, it's so easy to go into doom and gloom when we talk about climate change and everything that is happening. But when I started learning about soil from Julia, it was just like, well, this is a place of hope. Like yeah. there is so much potential and so much that we can do. Mm -hmm. And it is like, I mean, we've talked about our vision as being like healthy and robust, both ecological and social ecosystems. So mm -hmm. it's like, how can you I'll, I'll involve a local community? Sociological, ecological, and economic. Yeah, of course. Because yeah. if you, because <laughs> yeah. if, if you don't, if you yeah, don't yeah, absolutely. If you don't balance that part, a lot of the things fall apart. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But, but that being said, um, very excited about what you're doing. Um, thank you for uh, taking your time to come down and talk to Future cast. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for um, having us. And I'm glad that you're uh, building a version of future that uh, probably didn't exist in Iceland, and happy that you're making one. 
Thank right. you so, so much. Really, yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. So that was the ninth episode. And uh, so hopefully you all learned something. So I learned a lot of stuff. And uh, you can be rest assured we're going to be doing Bokashi fermenting in my house. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks. <laughs>